understand the Erlan battle, Peter, and I think it's interesting to look at where his forces really are in Kuwait, and obviously this is not intelligence data, but it picks up a point from General Trainer. A lot of what we know about defections comes from the low-grade infantry force in this area. Behind that, he's got his best forces, some 42 divisions in this whole area. Now, how many men is 42 divisions? Well, it's about 540,000, or it was before the air campaign. It could be substantially lower, but the important thing, Peter, is that when we talk about this, he's put his best forces, his armor, his mechanized divisions, and his Republican guards all down here. And he's left himself virtually exposed to the West. And when he talks about our going through his forward lines, we can go around them. We don't have to walk at an infantry pace the way that the Iranian infantry did. Uh, our armor can move through what is a pretty good road net in and out of here. And I th frankly think that uh, he is living in a past where he did very well in 1988, and it may not help him in 1991. But, but can we just go back to, to your map for a second? I mean, if you sure. did, I mean, even if an amateur like Boy, and they don't come any more amateur than me on this subject, takes a look at that map, and at the left side of the picture, you know that forces with armored personnel carriers and Bradley fight that fighting vehicles and tanks have the capacity to go around him. Why would he leave himself so exposed on his flanks there? Well, Peter, I'm sure he didn't think he was, because here are his Republican Guards units. All of these dark green things here are the effect of yeah. effectively armored and mechanized divisions. I'm sure he had no idea, and General Trainer and Bo Bob have pointed this out again and again, that he would lose perhaps 60 or 70 percent of the equipment in these key forces. Uh, it would have worked if they'd been mobile. They could have swung out into these areas. They could have dealt with the air land battle, but uh, one aspect of the whole air campaign is that his one way of moving has been virtually destroyed. Oh, put one of your squiggles back on there, the same squiggle back on there for Tony for a second. Let me ask you a question. Sure. What, what are those green things again? These are, and remember, Peter, we're not talking intelligence data, but uh, our estimates, these are the regular army mechanized and armored divisions. Okay. And I, I have to say one thing. They fought at least as well, if not better, than the Republican Guards. All right, now let's go back to the map. Saying, why can't they just turn, as I look at the television screen, why can't they just turn left and engage an American force that is coming in from the left? Well... Again, as General Trainer pointed in, many of them have dug in very heavily. But I think Bob hit on the key point. There is a debate over the figures, but if they have lost 40% of their artillery or 30% of their tanks, or even, let's say, 20% of their tanks and 30% of their artillery, uh, that normally, by World War II standards, was enough to make sure that a unit could not fight again. And remember, they've had no resupply. They're cut off from their logistic chain. Uh, if any of their trucks, fuel trucks, or other things come out, they're even more vulnerable than their armor. Okay, Tony, thanks very much. We'll come back to you in just a second. Um, just to reinforce that point, what we've heard a number of times from U.S. briefing officers at the Pentagon and from intelligence officers is that what they've had to do when their units have been broken up from the air was just to make another unit uh, with what was immediately... Uh, uh, immediately available so that they're not fighting all the time uh, with the people they're accustomed to fighting with or training with or servicing vehicles or tanks with uh, so that you lose a certain cohesion that comes with staying in a fairly closely knit group for a lengthy period of time. I want to go to the United Nations very briefly because ABC's David Ensor. David, I understand, have just talked to some of the Iraqis, correct? Uh, that's right, Peter. There's a group of, of the Iraqis, uh, Jordanians, and Palestinians gathered in the uh, delegates lounge in rather a somber mood tonight and I was talking with one of the senior Iraqi diplomats he just had two comments but I thought they might be of interest first of all he said my main thought tonight is that God willing we will fight well and honorably that's the most important thing for uh, for our nation now has been and why you are now confident that there is um, a minimal risk or however you want to characterize for our ground troops well I would not say uh that there is minimal risk. This is a major uh, military operation against a uh, well-equipped, uh, well-fortified opponent. 
Um, I would not want to underestimate uh, the difficulties of the task at all. What we have said repeatedly was that we wanted to conduct an air campaign uh, for as long as possible to destroy as much as possible of the Iraqi force and uh, to, to make it easier for us to undertake uh, the ground phase of the operation when that became possible. Uh, we obviously have reached that point where we think it's appropriate to kick in the next phase of the campaign. Mr. Secretary, the President said he has consulted with uh, all the allied coalition members. Can you give us a rough percentage of how many coalition members actually have committed ground forces and have actually are on the move? Uh, I don't want to do that tonight. That again gets us into the business of uh, talking about specific forces, specific units, and what they might be doing in connection with the operation. Um, a significant number of our allies are, in fact, participating in this phase of the campaign. Can you tell us about the process of consulting with them, or at least informing them, before we went ahead with the ground initiative? Can you give us a little bit of a sense of the reaction as you told them we're going in? There's really been uh, work at two levels. There's been work at the military level between uh, General Schwarzkopf and the other commanders in the field in terms of planning uh, the details of the operation, preparing the forces to carry them out. There's also been extensive consultation by the President uh, and Secretary Baker with uh, the uh, political leadership of those nations involved. Secretary, Mr. Secretary, the goal of this operation was to, to free Kuwait and the Soviets up to this last moment had an agreement by the Iraqis to pull out of Kuwait. What was the sense of urgency to move down to, to extract Saddam Hussein from Kuwait in light of that agreement? Well, it's been stated repeatedly, but I'll state it again, that um, the only acceptable solution uh, to this conflict is for complete compliance by the Iraqis with the UN Security Council resolutions. That includes the immediate unconditional withdrawal of their forces from Kuwait. As made clear by the President yesterday, we wanted uh, an indication from them that they would begin that withdrawal by noon today, and we gave them seven days uh, in which to complete it. Uh, they refused to do that. It included as well uh, consideration uh, for the fact that uh, the offer you talk about, uh, the proposition that the Soviets and the Iraqis developed, involved a ceasefire prior to any Iraqi withdrawal. We made it clear repeatedly we were not interested in any ceasefires, that a ceasefire would simply have allowed Saddam Hussein to regroup his forces, resupply them, and uh, could conceivably have cost uh, even more casualties. It's also true that uh, that proposition uh, embodied within it the repeal of all the other UN sanctions and resolutions uh, that had been voted by the Security Council. Uh, we felt that was totally unacceptable. Uh, we've seen just in the last uh, 72 hours uh, uh, what would appear to be a deliberate effort on the part of the Iraqis to uh, uh, further destroy what's left of Kuwait to put the torch to the oil fields, uh, reports of executions of Kuwaiti citizens inside Kuwait City. And uh, under the circumstances, the uh, notion that Saddam Hussein should be permitted to get away scot-free uh, without being held accountable for his actions or without having to pay reparations, for example, uh, was unacceptable from the standpoint of the coalition. The president's statement yesterday was very clear, it was very concise in terms of what we wanted from Saddam Hussein by way of compliance with these resolutions. It was agreed upon by the coalition. Uh, it was consistent with the UN Security Council resolutions. He would have been wise to accept it. Uh, he refused to do so. Mr. Mr. Secretary, Secretary, again, can, can you uh, put yourself in the position of disavowing uh, any effort to uh, change the government, the leadership, the political structure of Iraq, uh, in, by means of fully enforcing the uh, UN resolution. Suppose you knock him out of Kuwait and he says, I'm still not going to pay reparations. Uh, do you then go on to, to Baghdad to set up a government that, that will pay the reparations? We've made it uh, clear repeatedly that if uh, Saddam Hussein were to be replaced by another government, we would not shed a tear over his demise. But we've also made it clear that it is not an objective of U.S. policy to change the government of Iraq. If that happens, so be it. Uh, with respect to uh, 
the future uh, application of the sanctions that have already been voted by the UN Security Council, uh, how uh, they would be applied or altered uh, with respect to uh, this government of Iraq or some future government of Iraq is really a matter that the UN Security Council will have to address in due course once they're driven out of uh, Kuwait. I'll do one more, one more question. Any sort of communication whatsoever today from Saddam Hussein in any form? None that I'm aware of. Mr. Secretary. Uh, again, let me, uh, by way of closing, uh, emphasize what I mentioned at the outset, that we recognize we have an obligation to provide as much information as we possibly can to the press and to the American people. But we are currently engaged in an extremely complex uh, military undertaking. Uh, the lives of literally thousands of Americans and allied personnel are at stake. And we simply have to operate on the basis that we are going to, for the time being, uh, put a lid on further briefings about uh, the operation. As soon as it's, as soon as it's possible to do so, uh, General Schwarzkopf and Riyadh, uh, General Powell here at the Pentagon, uh, will be happy to provide as much detail as possible about the campaign itself. But uh, that's going to have to await uh, developments. Thank you very much. What time did it start? 10.35, two hours since this land campaign began, according to the British, uh, who, uh, from the Prime Minister's residence in London, said that's exactly when it began, 8.30 this evening. Uh, the Secretary coming out to uh, tell you, in terms of the military campaign, not much more than we suspect you probably know if you've been watching television or listening to the radio uh, for the last uh, little while. The campaign has uh, begun, the land campaign, on a broad uh, basis and will continue. Um, there'll also be uh, some discussion, uh, not a lot of it uh, right at the moment, but certainly in the hours and the days ahead, about the information policy of the Pentagon. Uh, we don't have an official uh, policy about it here. Um, this business of suspending all briefings now is, you may be interested to know, in direct contradiction to what the Pentagon told us a few days ago they were going to do. They said they were going to go on with their regular briefings. Uh, there is, as uh, you know just as well as we do, a very considerable argument in the country now about the relationship between the press and the media. And there are Americans, both in and out of the media, who think that the Pentagon uh, wishes to offer operate uh, very much in the dark to a far greater extent than it ever has before. And uh, we are aware, any of us who read our mail are aware, uh, that there are a great many Americans uh, who support uh, that position. And we also know by reading our mail there are many Americans who think uh, that this is not a good policy. That notwithstanding, um, it is part of the debate in democracy, but that is the Secretary's uh, position for now. I can only say probably that it's going to lead to some considerable dissension uh, between the press and the military and again as always people will choose sides some on behalf of the military uh, some on behalf of the press there are pools you may have heard the secretary or at least the spokesman uh, refer to the pools uh, there are 18 20 more than 20 military pools out with uh, armed forces in the field where reporters are out representing other reporters in small groups um, we simply do not know uh, when information will come back from actual combat units in the field, um, but for now, uh, we and you are going to live um, with the rules that the Pentagon has set down, because whether we or you like it, uh, that is what uh, they have decided. Um, so let us move on now to what we know. Not everybody, by the way, feels as strongly about this policy as the Secretary of Defense. The Kuwaiti News Agency has reported within the last several minutes that the Allied forces have captured, and we can take a look at it, I think, on a map, uh, the small island of Failaka, uh, which uh, the Iraqis were using to guard the entrance, really, the water entrance uh, uh, to Kuwait City. It's not too far off the coast. It's an island of considerable... It's not a big island, but it's... Uh, it's not a spit and a whistle in the middle of the water either. Uh, the U.S. had been bombing it for the last several days, including using what's called daisy cutters, um, some very devastating bombs. According to U.S. Uh, military briefers over the last several days, there were um, Iraqi infantry and Iraqi mechanized brigades, that is to say armor on it. But according to the Kuwaiti news agency, um, the liberation of Jazirat, the island of Failaka, has occurred after the destruction of Iraqi tanks on the island was completed. Now, I just want to correct myself. Um, the British said the land campaign started at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, about two and a half hours ago, not at 8.30, as I stated. Um, 